Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this session in which we are going to talk about randomness and about ways of creating random numbers on a computer. So before we get on with the lecture, let me motivate the need of having random numbers and why do we need to create random numbers on a computer. So as mentioned in an earlier session, in a Monte Carlo simulation, we are actually sampling in a sense from a model and we do many replications and this allows us to approximate the expectation of the outcome from a model. So this is the Monte Carlo simulation. In general, in all discrete event simulations of our interest, we would require random numbers to represent uncertainty in the system. For example, the arrival patterns of customers, in our case it may be packets, they are uncertain. The service time distribution is uncertain. But for the sake of simplicity, we can assume that these uncertainties can be replaced by certain statistical distributions. So having made this assumption and this simplification, how do we proceed further? How can we sample from these distributions? To, to, do, to do that, we actually need to be able to generate random numbers. So the first application area is that whenever we want to do stochastic simulations, we require random numbers which are uniformly distributed and also random variates which is a technical word which refers to random numbers that are sampled from distributions other than uniform distribution. For example, uh, a uniformly distributed random number would be referred to as simply a random number but a Poisson distributed sequence of random numbers would be referred to as a sequence of random variates. So we already have talked about design of experiments and in that we saw the benefit of using randomized sampling and there are many algorithms which bank upon the randomness for their execution and every time we are uh, making use of a sample typically we tend to go for random samples because having a random sample is the best bet against bias and prejudices. So if you have a random sample that is uh, sampling from the entire population, it is your best chance of having a good representation or a good valid conclusion about the population at large. Also another field in which random numbers are required is cryptography and especially in this modern world of internet, e-commerce is critically dependent on random numbers. So in that sense, random numbers also require unpredictability. So every time you're using a credit card on the internet to do some shopping, you're actually using random numbers. Every time you're accessing your email over a secure SSL channel on the internet, you're making use of random numbers. Also, random numbers are used in lotteries and entertainment games. And randomness is a very general and a very classical concept that philosophers have been grappling over for many centuries. What is precisely randomness? That is an elusive question. For example, if I ask you, what is the population of the entire world at this time? You would agree with me that this is a deterministic thing. So if uh, we had a superpower or a supernatural being, who could be knowing everything, uh, he, uh, you know, that being would be able to know this because there is nothing inherently random about this. But it is because of our ignorance that we are not able to comprehend this. Another example would be if I flip a coin now, it can either come up as a heads or a tails. But if I look at the output, I know what the output is. And therefore, uh, the output is either a heads or a tails and there is no in a sense probabi probability to it. But another person who does not know the outcome can talk in terms uh, of uh, a frequentist approach that if we were to repeat this experiment multiple, uh, multiple times then law of large numbers would uh, indicate or would uh, dictate that the ratios converge towards the probability. 
So randomness uh, then is uh, in the eye of the beholder. And we can also say that randomness is to be defined uh, from the perspective of the application. As we move forward in this lecture, we'd be seeing the intricacies of randomness. We'd be seeing that how can we create random numbers on computers. And before that, we can talk of true random generating methods. For example, the flipping of a coin, the rolling of a die, the uh, flipping of a roulette. In all these cases, these are referred to as true random number generating devices because uh, we cannot predict per se what outcome is going to come. But on a computer, we cannot have such a method or it is impractical and in a sense, it is cumbersome to interface such devices to a computer. It is advantageous to us if we can have a deterministic method of creating random numbers the sequence of which is indistinguishable from a sequence that was possibly created by a true random number generating device. So we're going to talk of methods of creating random numbers and random variates on a computer. And finally, we're going to see methods of distinguishing between good ways of generating random numbers and bad ways of creating random numbers. And before you rush to create a random number of your own, let me advise you that this is a very tricky business. It is in fact very hard to create a good random number. And specialists have been working on this for many years and they have been found lacking. Every time you see a new random number generator being proposed, it lists down the weaknesses of previous approaches. And the people who have been working on this for a very, very long time, even they have been wrong about this. One reason for that is that, you know, as humans, our brains are, in a sense, uh, uh, primed for picking patterns out. We are not really trained to think in terms of randomness. And uh, this concept would become clearer as we move on in today's session. Let us start with a very basic question. Given any number, can we say that number is a random number? In fact, this question was posed by Don Knuth, the famous computer scientist who has written uh, multiple volumes of his classical book, The Art of Computer Programming, which is considered a classic in computer science circles. In volume two, he describes, he has a chapter on random numbers and he asks the question that is two a random number? So two is a placeholder for all possible numbers. So given any number, how can we say that that number was actually an outcome of some random number generating device? In fact, we cannot do that. And in fact, all numbers, if we were to think in terms of how interesting they are, or uh, if we are to associate some pattern to it, we can always find a pattern or uh, some meaning to any number, or you know, we can describe them as interesting. An interesting anecdote here uh, can be mentioned. It is said that uh, you know, a famous uh, British, British mathematician, Hardy, went to his student, uh, the Indian uh, uh, mathematician Ramunajan, and he was actually visiting Ramunajan because uh, Ramunajan was sick. And he said that I was coming on a taxi, and the taxi had the number 1729 on its number plate. That's quite an uninteresting number. And Ramunajan, who was uh, a prodigy, he was very good at mathematics, and he immediately said that, no, no, not at all. 1729 is, in fact, a very interesting number. It is the smallest number expressible as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. For example, 1729 is equal to the sum of the cubes of 9 and 10 and also the sum of cubes of 1 and 12. So because of that, this number is interesting. And on the basis of this, logically extending this, one can think of, okay, what is the smallest uninteresting number? Many numbers have their own Wikipedia pages and they are very interesting in their own right. So what is the smallest uninteresting number? It is said that there is no smallest uninteresting number. 
because if there was a smallest uninteresting number, it would be interesting uh, on the basis of just that. So we can uh, conclude on the basis of this uh, argument that we cannot really associate randomness or interestingness to a number like that. We have to think in more deep terms. If we have to define randomness, just by looking at a number, we cannot say if it was created by a random source or a deterministic source. But we can talk about uh, this in some sense about sequences of random numbers. And the famous American polymath, the creator of the architecture used in modern computer systems, also has a big part in the creation of the Monte Carlo method. He said that there is no such thing as a random number. There are only methods to produce random numbers. So this is a very important thing. We cannot observe a number and say that this is a random number, but random number may be created by some random process, but we cannot say for sure. So we can analyze a sequence of random numbers, and then if it has some properties, we can then say reservedly that this looks random. So an interesting cartoon in this regard was published in Dilbert and Dilbert is taking visitor to the accounting office and he's saying that over here we have a random number generator but the random number generator is saying a sequence of numbers which seems very deterministic. So the random number generator says 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9 and 9. So six nines in succession. So what is the visitor to make of this? Was this a real random string? Most of us would believe that this is not a random string. So this would be like flipping six coins in a row. Um, but if we flip six uh, coins in a row, it is a distinct possibility that we would have six uh, straight heads. In this case, obviously, you have uh, multiple digits. Uh, you're thinking in terms of numbers from 1 till 9 or 0 till 9, but we can simplify and think of, uh, you know, zeros and ones. If we see a succession of ones or a succession of zero, can we say from the output itself that this is not a random thing? Uh, we have to go back to the random, uh, to the generating process. And on, on the basis of this, uh, generating process can we only say if this was a method of a random method of creating numbers or a non-random way of creating numbers. So the interesting aspect about this cartoon is that in fact it is possible that this may be a random source because in any truly random sequence you will have local non-randomness and this has completely baffled the intuition of us humans because then we seem to very quickly come to the conclusion that this is not a real random sequence. As an example, on the slide you can see multiple numbers. So you have a succession, a chain or a sequence of zeros and ones. But Don Knuth said that any truly random sequence will show local non-randomness because even low probability events will happen in the long run. Because when we say low probability, it means it has some non-zero probability. And in the limiting sense, even very rare events will occur with almost certainty. Because we are thinking of the very long run. In finite time, we are going to wait. So even very small probabilities, things are going to happen. For example, in this sequence, if we highlight, there are many streaks of zeros and ones. And a person who was to only observe that sequence may think that this is not a truly random source. But the key idea that I would like to convey to you is that while our intuition may lead us somewhere else, but we must understand that a truly random sequence will have some local non-randomness. It is only in the very long run that things would even out. And we've talked about this, we talked of the mythical law of small numbers, which is a logical fallacy which many people believe in. It is also referred to as the gambler's fallacy. So if I'm flipping a coin and I have 10 heads in a row, for the 11th toss, 
the probability is still 0.5 for a hedge assuming we have a fair coin but many people would believe that the probability has changed which is not the case so how do we then reason about this okay imagine a sequence is given to you as you can see on the slide now it is a sequence of digits 4 5 9 2 6 5 3 and some random digits following after that does this seem random enough to you it seems random enough to me because the numbers are being shuffled and there is no obvious pattern to it but if we were to look very closely we would find local non-randomness or we would find streaks or some patterns and that is a very important and key idea that even true randomness will show certain coincidences it will show certain chunks of noise which will appear like a pattern so in fact this number is from the sequence of pi and pi has been often proposed as a source of creating random numbers because if we do statistical analysis to judge randomness the digits almost have a uniform distribution and there is no obvious pattern to it but if we observe closely we see some curious coincidences for example we see a 26 and it is followed after some time by another 26 and then we see some other pairs that are repeating for example 79 and 79 is repeating 32 and 32 is repeating 38 and 38 is repeating so this looks curious and one might be tempted to say that this is not really random but even for truly random sources coincidences will happen if you look closely enough so how are we then going to reason about this we say that if we have a sequence a desired property of randomness would manifest itself in very long periodicity or no periodicity ideally you would like no periodicity but if we have an artificial method of creating randomness that we are going to use in computers we will settle for very long periodicity if your periodicity is going to take you back to an initial value after let's say a very very large period it does not matter for practical reasons but even for this condition we have to be a little pragmatic so for example 0 1 0 0 1 1 0 0 0 1 1 1 is not periodic but there is a distinct pattern here and you know no one would say that this is something random also if we have a random sequence and if we observe a long enough sequence so for a long enough time we are observing the sequence the number of zeros and ones would be approximately equal in the long run also if we consider two tuples that is one number and the next number and if we make a pair of this then you have four possibilities a zero and a zero zero one one zero and a one one all of them should occur approximately equally and you can extend this idea to larger tuples for example a three tuple would have eight possibilities and in a truly random sequence that is observed long enough you would have approximately equal occurrences of all these eight patterns so this is something that can guide us in our quest for defining randomness randomness is something that many people have grappled over and in fact something that is truly random does not look really random and in fact this was uh, evident in the case where apple has these mp3 players known as ipod and they have a functionality known as random shuffle so in the beginning the designers of apple created a random shuffle which was actually random and because if we have something that is actually random it is possible that you come back to the same thing so if you are playing a song the next song may be the same song again if we are considering true randomness it's, this will happen especially in the long run if you consider a long enough interval but many people complain that your random shuffle is not really random and this gave an opportunity to steve jobs to quip that we are making this shuffle less random to make it feel more random and this is an important idea what feels random to us may not be necessarily random 
So for all methods that we'd be studying for creating random numbers, it is important that we do not only rely on human intuition because that can fail us, especially when we deal with uh, you know random numbers and probability. Our intuition is not very well equipped to deal with randomness. As a further evidence of this, let's play a game. On the screen, you can see six squares in which we have 12 dots. And I can tell you that some of these squares were filled by a computer algorithm which was creating or placing these dots randomly. And for one of these squares, it was placed by a human who was trying to imitate randomness. Can you pick the one? in which we have the human imitating the randomness or alternatively pressed, can you tell me which one of these actually look random to you? Many people actually choose the bottom right square as the square that appears random to you. And in fact, this was the box that was chosen by the human and it was filled by a human. This is artificial randomness that is created by humans. If you observe this, you would observe that the dots are placed in an equitable manner. So they're not very close to each other. There is no streak as such or there is no pattern as such. Because when we talk of randomness, as humans, we are trained to think that randomness means something devoid totally of patterns. But we've observed that randomness, the true randomness would actually show itself in some streaks and it would have some coincidences. So in fact, for all the other boxes, those boxes were filled by genuine randomness, which was created by a computer. But if you were to do an experiment through some true number generating devices, you would actually get a similar result. In random occurrences, coincidences do happen. Okay, so with this uh, intro, and some description about what randomness really is. Let's now talk about random number generation, the various methods that we have, and then we would talk about how do we go about quantifying the goodness of these generators. We would be actually talking of a couple of tests, and we'd be mentioning uh, what other measures do we have. So when we talk of random number generation, we are actually talking of uh, having a sequence in which we are going to create numbers that are uniformly distributed from 0 to 1. So for example, on the screen now you would see a spinner and if you spin this spinner, it will come to a stop somewhere between this interval. And that is uh, in a sense what we mean by creation of a random number. So let's trace the history of this field. How has this field been codified and how has this field developed? So in the beginning, we did not have computers and we had uh, different devices for producing random digits, but those devices were somewhat cumbersome because it took a lot of time to do many coin flips or to roll many dice or to you know use whatever mechanism you have. If you're using a physical mechanism of producing digits, it was, uh, in a sense, not very satisfactory. In the 1920s and 30s, people started working on this and they created books in which only random numbers were published and those random numbers had some good properties. So the first uh, book was published by a statistician known as Tippett and he was a student of Carl Pearson, a very famous British uh, statistician and it was on his advice that he published a book only on random numbers. So this may sound funny that you go to a bookstore and you have a book which has nothing except random numbers. The reason for having such a book was that at that time statistics was a very hot field. There were many you know, active researchers and they wanted access to random numbers for creating you know, samples because for samples, it is important that we do random sampling. And uh, to do random sampling, people were, people were often depending on their intuition and were choosing the samples in a haphazard manner. But in fact, we've seen that our intuition often fails us when we are seeking 
the elusiveness uh, of randomness. So instead, it's better that we have some known uh, you know, sequence of random numbers and we universally use that. At least that was the thought that led to the publication of these books. In around 1940s and 1950s, a book was published by the Rand Corporation which had a million random numbers. And it was sufficient for that time, but obviously as uh, computer systems have progressed, we require more and more random numbers. And in fact, a million random numbers would be acutely insufficient for most simulation tasks these days. So now the question was how are these random numbers generated or how can they be generated by true random number generating devices. So we could choose devices, physical devices like a coin or a die or we can make use of physical devices that actually sample from some inherently uncertain physical process. For example, we may make use of a noise diode or we may be sampling thermal noise. There are solutions that are focusing on sampling the blobs that move in lava lamps. The idea is that you seek outside a computer and you generate randomness from some physical device. That has been mostly how randomness has been created. In some cases, it is vital that we actually use physical true random number generating devices. For example, in lotteries, we cannot make use of uh, pseudo random numbers that are generated on a computer according to a deterministic algorithm because if someone knew that algorithm, they could predict what outcome would be coming. So for such events like lotteries, we have special devices that are capturing true randomness by usually interfacing with the outside system. An example of this is the Ernie system which is used in UK in their lottery systems. Intel has proposed and have incorporated a source of true random number generating device in their chips. And this promises to revolutionize this field, but as of now, this has not become mainstream. So we'd be focusing on pseudo random methods of creating random numbers because they are uh, easy to do on a computer and it is not straightforward interfacing these external physical devices with a computer. If we have a computer and if we have good deterministic algorithms that can produce sequences that are indistinguishable from random numbers, we can make use of them, especially if our application is not very critical or demands a very high standard of randomness. Another important reason why we make use of computer generated random variables is that those random variables are created according to deterministic method. And therefore, if we have the same input parameter, we're going to have the same output. In other words, we can reproduce those numbers. This allows us in doing uh, research and in doing science because uh, if we have some result, we can share our seeds and uh, the parameters that were used to create those random numbers and anyone uh, can replicate those experiments. Also, it may be of interest to you to carry on from uh, some place where you left previously. In a true random number generating device, we cannot replicate you know, the occurrences of some previous events because everything happens on chance and we cannot replicate back what has happened in the past. So we're going to focus on pseudo random ways of creating random numbers. These are known as pseudo random numbers because uh, they are not truly random although true randomness is again a slippery concept but the idea is they are pseudo random because they are created on a computer according to a well-known method of creating random numbers. So an interesting quote that is relevant here is due to von Neumann who said that anyone who considers arithmetical methods of producing random digits is of course in a state of sin. For as has been pointed out several times, there is no such thing as a random number. 
there are only methods to produce random numbers and a strict arithmetic procedure is of course not such a method. From this one may conclude that von Neumann was against the usage of arithmetic ways for creating random digits. That's not completely true because he was in fact the creator of one of the first methods of creating random digits from arithmetic methods through the method known as the middle square method that we shall very shortly see. But his objection was referring to this pseudo random way of creating digits to uh, we should not be saying that the, this is a true random method of creating digits. So he was making the distinction very clear. So let us now see what are the properties of pseudo random number generating devices or random numbers that we should have. So firstly the most important property is that if you have a sequence of numbers that are random they must be uniformly distributed and also they must be independent from each other. In other words there should be no correlation between one digit and the subsequent digits. So whatever has come before should not affect what is coming next. We shall see that this is not very strictly met always because in most deterministic methods we are making use of linear methods and we would, uh, we would uh, actually mention this uh, in, in, uh, later in this session uh, when we talk of linear congruential generator whatever is coming afterwards actually does depend on what has come before but we are talking of appearances. If the sequence of random numbers appears independent then we should be happy uh, about this pseudo random sequence. Also when we talk of uniformly distributed it means that if we are calculating numbers from 0 to 1 and we make small bins and we do uh, we calculate a histogram things should be equally distributed. It should not be that we have a peak somewhere and some other interval is very rarely used. So in that sense we, uh, we want uh, uniform distribution. So both these properties are very important. Secondly the pseudo random number generating methods should be fast and they should not require a lot of storage because the need of storage was what made us go against the method of having tabulated random numbers. It required significant storage and it was also static. But uh, since we are making use of uh, computer methods this is what we desire. We require fast methods and also which uh, methods that do not require a lot of storage. We would also like reproducibility. In other words the random digits should be generated by a function which is reproducible. If you give the same input to this function you would get the same output back. This is useful in science because you may require to verify your simulation program and to debug it. So if we have the ability of replicating exactly the randomness used in your simulation programs it becomes very easy for us to troubleshoot in such scenarios. Also using this we can generate identical random numbers and give them to different alternative choices that we have and then it allows a fairer comparison between those two choices. So for a fairer comparison we would like to use the same random numbers for two entities. This cannot be met in true random uh, number generating devices because in that method nothing is deterministic but in pseudo random number generating methods we like reproducibility. And also an important thing is that we should have methods of easily producing separate streams of random numbers because on a single computer system when we are running a simulation the simulation model may have multiple sources of randomness. For the simplest queuing example uh, you have one kind of randomness that is associated with the arrival pattern. You have another kind of randomness that is associated with the service times and therefore we would like different streams of uh, random numbers for these two different entities. If we were to give them the same random numbers it, it would turn out that we would actually be getting 
invalid conclusions because there would be a correlation between these two, uh, you know, random streams. Uh, it is possible that uh, if we have correlation, uh, whenever there is a higher inter-arrival time, the service time would also be higher, which is, uh, it may not be what we are trying to capture. So, what we really want is that the different streams that we have, they should not be correlated to each other. Of all these four properties, the one which makes or breaks a random number generating method is actually point one. And this is uh, actually the condition that is failed by many random uh, number generators. And we would see that how we can test various random number generators. So now we can talk of the method that was proposed by von Neumann to generate random digits, but according to an arithmetic method. So this is a very simple method. Von Neumann observed that if you start with an n digit number, we refer to this as a seed because this is going to dictate what is the next number we are going to have. So we start with an n digit number. As an example, we start with 5497. We simply square this number. So when we square this, we will have a 2n digit number. If this is not a 2n digit number, we would pad it up at leading zeros and then we take the middle n digits and that is our next random number. So it is a very simple method, but it suffers from a problem. And that problem is that this is a periodic generator. Eventually, you're going to come back to the same seed and then from there onwards, you're going to have another period starting. Because when we're thinking of n digits, whatever value we start with, you have only finite number of possibilities. And when you have exhausted all of those, you're either going to come back to the same one, and when you do that, you're going to start off a new period. Things can be even worse than this. It may be that all of the possible 2 raised to n possible uh, digits are not used. It is possible that you uh, settle down into a very short cycle. Especially if you get a sequence of all zeros, whenever this is used as uh, a seed, the next random uh, you know, digits that you're going to have is also going to be the same. And therefore, this is going to be a null cycle. So, let me give you an example of how the output that we have generated here can be converted into a uniform random number that is distributed between 0 and 1. We will also see that this method is uh, critically dependent on what seed is being used. So, for example, we are making use of the middle square method. We are uh, using n is equal to 4, so we have 4 digits. The starting seed is 6500. If we start with this, we square this up, we take the middle n digits, the middle 4 digits, it comes out to be 2500. And we can convert that into a uniform random number by writing a zero dot in front of that. The point I'm trying to make here is that if you are unlucky, you may go to a seed that actually has a very short cycle. In this case, when we have 2500 as a value, for the next value, you're going to get the same value back again. So this is a very short cycle. Fortunately, in all cases, you will not have such a short cycle. Uh, and this method was used for many years in uh, the Manhattan Project, where von Neumann was working, and where Monte Carlo method was discovered, and they had a need of random numbers. So for certain values of the seed, so you can choose a large enough uh, you know, seed, and for certain choices, you're going to have a very large period. But even that very large period, by today's definition, is woefully short. We would see that, in fact, this method is not used these days, except as uh, an instructive technique. We talk about that this thing is an example of arithmetic ways of creating random numbers, but we don't use this in practice. Because it is hard to choose the seed that will actually give us a good sequence. And also, the sequence that we are going to get does not have very nice properties. Let's talk about one of the most popular ways of creating random digits. And this method is due to Derek Lehmer, who discovered in 1951 
that the residues of a number's successive powers have good randomness properties. So, if we are interested in calculating some random number, we can take some number which we describe here as A and we successively raise it to N and then we take the mod of this over M. It turns out that this number has a good randomness property. A way of doing this practically is uh, described next. We see that we can have multiplicative linear congruential generator where linear congruential generator is the general technique proposed by Lemur. In a multiplicative LCG, we have the relationship that the next output is going to be the previous output. If you're starting out, this would be the seed value. This is multiplied by a multiplier which we refer to as A and we take the modulus of this over M. So A is the multiplier, M is the modulus and this is the multiplicative LCG. Very simple but it still has good properties. Mixed LCG is a little different in which you multiply the previous value or if you're starting out the seed value by the multiplier A but you also add a constant C to it and then you take a modulus over the value M which is the modulus. So if we do that this is known as the mixed LCG method. Both of them have similar properties not identical but similar properties. And then the produced number can be scaled to the interval 0 to 1 by dividing the produced number by the modulus M. Let's take an example of this. We are going to use a multiplicative LCG. The multiplier value that we're going to choose is 3. So A is equal to 3. The modulus that is chosen is 7. So the value of M is 7. And now we have enough information for successively creating and cranking out random digits. So we start with Z0 is equal to 1 to 7. This is the seed something that we start with. So we're going to multiply this with A and then take the mod of this over the modulus which is M. We get the next value of 3. From that we get the next value of 2. From that we get the next value of 6, then 4, then 5, then 1 and then we get 3 again. And now we have completed a cycle. So from 3 onwards we are going to repeat the same thing again and again. So this has a period of 6. So if you note the cycle, it is 3, 2, 6, 4, 5, 1 and again you repeat this again and again. So because the modulus was 7, the best that we can do in a multiplicative LCG is a sequence of period 6. If uh, the modulus is 7, you have uh, a period 1 less than that. If in general your modulus is represented by M, a full period, the multiplicative LCG would have a period of M minus 1. You can represent this in a spinner that is seen here and we see that depending on the value that you start from, you are going to have a full period of 6 random digits that are going to periodically repeat because in this case the modulus is 7. It is not always the case that you would always have a full period even for the same modulus. Here the modulus is 7. If we choose some other multiplier, let's say we started with a seed of 1 and we had a multiplier of 1, then your sequence would be 1, 1, 1 and you only have a cycle of 1. If you had chosen a value of multiplier of 2, then you would have a sequence of 2, 4, 1 and again starting again. So we have to choose the parameters very carefully, the multiplier and the modulus has, has to be chosen very carefully and uh, we have some well-known random number generators and we have some parameters for them already chosen which we can use as a reference. So the parameter chosen by Lemur when he proposed his LCG method in 1951, he chose a multiplier of A is equal to 23 and a modulus of 10 raised to 8 plus 1. Thereafter, a particularly bad random number generator was used much on IBM systems and this is a textbook example of things going wrong. 
we would see this, how this thing does not perform very well. Here, for computational reasons, the multiplier was chosen as 2 raised to 16 plus 3, and the modulus was chosen as 2 raised to 32. Only for computational reasons, because it made calculations easy. But we would see that this is in fact a very poor random number generator. We also have other random number generators. The minimal standard which we should use unless we have a random number generator that has known properties better than this was proposed as LCG 16807 which had a multiplier of uh, 16807 and a modulus of 2 raised to 32 minus 1. And we have some new generators. An example is Mersin Twister and Multiply with Kerry, which was proposed by Marsaglia. And these are methods in which we have very large periods. So many of the common simulation tools actually implement these. Okay, now we can talk very briefly about random variate generation. Up till now, we have been talking about generation of random numbers that are uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. But how do we generate a random variate that may belong to an arbitrary distribution? We will talk only of a single method. Obviously, there are multiple methods, but we are going to talk of the simplest method, which is known as inverse transformation. It is based on a very simple observation. All the distributions, they usually have a cumulative distribution function or a CDF. But a CDF is simply a function that has a y-axis value between 0 and 1. So we already are able to calculate a random number between 0 and 1. If we can connect these two ideas together, we can actually calculate random variates that belong to different distributions. And this precise idea actually leads to a very simple implementation. We can choose a value between 0 and 1, and then we can do an inverse function. In other words, given the CDF value, we can calculate x value. You can see on the slide that if we choose a value u which is close to 0.8 in this case, and then we see what value of uh, x corresponds to this. In other words, we are making use of an inverse function, the f inverse of u. This gives us the random variate. So f inverse of u is in fact the inverse of the CDF. So you can actually read about this in your textbook and there are other methods. There is the acceptance rejection methods which was proposed by von Neumann and used by him. There is also the composition method but we shall not have time to cover those in this course. Lastly, let's talk about ways of testing random numbers. In this regard, a very pragmatic definition was given by Derek Lemer, the creator of the LCG method, and he said that a random sequence is a vague notion in which each term is unpredictable to the uninitiated and whose digits pass a certain number of tests, those are traditional with statisticians. In other words, there is no absolute random sequence, but we would refer to a sequence as random if it is unpredictable to someone who does not know the method of generating it and also it pass some test which we design for testing if uh, we actually have uniform distribution and if we have independence. We can divide these tests into two types. One is referred to as an empirical test. In this category, we refer to the observations that are coming from the random generating source and we quantify the randomness based on those observations. We are not referring to the original method of creating those numbers. In theoretical test, we refer to the method which is creating those numbers and we analyze it using theory to see what is the performance of that system. So as an example of an empirical test, we can make use of a frequency test, which we've covered before in earlier sessions. Uh, we talked of the chi-square test. As an example of this, uh, this is an example from your textbook. This is a mixed LCG in which you have a multiplier, a constant, and also a modulus. And you have a sequence of 1,000 random numbers. And you divide it into 10 cells. 
and you make a histogram and you have an expectation of because this thing is uniformly distributed and you have thousand random numbers you expect that on average you would have hundred random digits in each of these bins or these cells but it turns out that we have some discrepancy which is to be expected because these expectations only apply in the long run but the question is that is this discrepancy large enough so in this case we calculate the chi-square statistic to be 14.68 for a confidence level of 90 percent and for nine degrees of freedom this is the critical value the test statistic that we calculate is actually less than this this is 10.380 and because this is less than this, we will fail to reject our null hypothesis that these numbers are uniformly distributed IID random numbers. This was the empirical method. Let's talk very briefly about an example of a theoretical test. In this, we will be analyzing the performance of an LCG through what is known as a spectral method. This actually is based on a finding by George Massaglia who observed that in an LCG, all the K tuples are actually going to fall on parallel hyperplanes having dimension K minus 1. So, this is the mathematical description of it. This becomes easier to understand through an example. If we are considering two tuples, that is two successive numbers, it would turn out if we make a 2D plot, they would lie on a finite number of 1D lines. If we make a plot of successive triplets, they would lie on a finite number of 2D planes. As an example, you can see two generating sources. The first function has the value of a is equal to 3 and the second one has a value of a is equal to 13. The modulus is the same. You can see the random digits generated and you see that they have a full period and also they would pass the chi-square test for uniformity. But if we plot them in, in a 2D plot, we would see that all these points are actually coming on finite number of lines. And if we compare both of them, we would see that the generator in which the multiplier is 3 actually has larger distance between these lines. In the case of the first generator where the multiplier is 3, we have the maximum distance of 9.8. For the other we have a maximum distance of 5.7 and then therefore theoretically we can say that the second generator is better. There is no end of tests that we can devise and in fact many many tests have been devised. But for the purpose of this course and this lecture our intention was just to introduce you to one or two methods of testing. Let me now conclude this lecture. We have seen that it is a substantial undertaking if we want to construct a good random number generator. A method that is chosen at random or haphazardly will typically not have good properties. We have also seen that it is very important to do proper testing of your random number generators and to use good practices as defined in the latest papers so that we do not use a random number generator that is flawed. So with this, I'd like to end this lecture. Thank you for joining. Assalamu alaikum.